Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning for everybody on the planet who is joining the virtual EGEV20. I hope you have already enjoyed several sessions at EGEV, and uh, I would like to point your attention as a co-chair of the Eurovis School Paper Program to this program check as well. I hope you will find it very interesting. But uh, at this moment, I would like to welcome you to the first keynote at the EGEV, which will be given by the Dr. Jackie Faherty, who is uh, not coming directly from visualization field or computer graphics uh, uh, domain, but she is uh, using visualization maybe more often than uh, visualization researchers do. And she's using it uh, both in uh, research and uh, in outreach of her work. Dr. Jackie Faherty is a physicist and uh, astronomer. Uh, she has uh, been uh, studying at uh, Stony Brook um, and uh, graduated with her PhD in physics and astrophysics in 2010. And in her research, she is uh, focusing on studying the brown dwarfs. For us uh, in the field of computer graphics and visualization, brown dwarfs are not some, uh, some creatures from animated movies. Brown dwarfs are something like stars, but uh, they are a little bit different from stars. They are somehow a little bit more cool because in their formation, they uh, also collect the dust and gas and collapse it. But this uh, collapse process doesn't lead to the nuclear fusion. So they are a little bit different from the stars and they are scientifically very interesting. So Dr. Faherty is uh, using uh, visualization for looking at the brown dwarfs, but uh, her role is not only in uh, conducting research, but her role is also in uh, doing the outreach of the research in astronomy. She is uh, coming from the American Museum of uh, Natural History, where she is using visualization to tell stories about the space. Um, besides other um, um, achievements which uh, Dr. Faherty uh, has done during her career, I would just like to mention the uh, prestigious grant she has uh, obtained for her research in the NASA Hubble Fellowship and the NSF International Fellowship. But now we will hear about uh, the story from uh, the early visualizations up to today's interactive scientific visualizations uh, Dr. Faherty is conducting and showing to all of us uh, in museal context. Dr. Faherty, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ivan. That was such a lovely introduction. And now I'm going to go to share screen. And see if we can get ourselves started here. Um, it is definitely a pleasure to be doing this, and it is also super strange to be doing this in this virtual world that we're all in. Um, so I am going to get started. Thank you so much for tuning in from wherever you are, from whatever time zone you're in, if it's morning, night. I'm not even sure where um, other zones you might be in. For me, on the East Coast of the United States, it's morning. And um, you just got a little bit of an introduction to me. Very critical to this talk is the following. While I am an academic researcher, and my passion is these low temperature objects called brown dwarfs and what they tell us about the star formation process and what we might expect from atmospheres of exoplanets beyond our own solar system, none of that is going to appear in this talk. Um, the other side of me that will be showcased in this talk is um, highlighted by the fact that I work at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. You can see our lovely site of location in my title slide here in the exact foreground that um, Alex has brought up in here, you can see that there it is, the American Museum of Natural History with Central Park right in front. Uh, and within the American Museum of Natural History, 
is the Hayden Planetarium, which is an absolutely astounding visualization center. We use it primarily at the planetarium and within the museum to showcase a blockbuster film about um, space. And we run it uh, every 30 minutes within the dome. But it also happens to be that I am an academic researcher. And so I love the idea of stellar maps and exploring stellar maps and what they might mean for us. And so I started to use both the software that we are, are showcasing at AMNH as well as the location itself to explore scientific data. So today for this keynote, what I'm gonna take you through is how we've been mapping the stars, how astronomers have taken us from hand drawings that were made because as long as humans have been looking up, we've been intrigued by the nighttime sky all the way through to today, to the modern uh, catalogs and what we have from high-end astronomical observatories and how we can take you now on a virtual flight of the cosmos through these stellar maps. So I'm gonna start us at the beginning or at least what I've gathered as the beginning. Uh, and that beginning is going to start us in China. Um, and my first slide here is a star chart. This is one of the uh, oldest known recorded complete stellar catalogs. This is a panel of a multi-long scroll that was found along the Silk Road in the year roughly 1900. Uh, and in this depiction, you can see there are the dots which represent stars that are connected. And there were roughly 1300 stars that were mapped on this scroll. And it's a representation of the nighttime sky as seen through China. And these were put into shapes that would have been, there's roughly 250 shapes or so across this whole scroll. And these were the patterns of the stars that the Chinese saw. Astronomy has always played a role in, um, in uh, kingdoms, in politics of ancient times where an emperor would have wanted an astronomer to be cataloging the nighttime sky, as oftentimes it was thought that the stars told the stories of what might come to be. It was before we really understood our relationship or what the physics were of stars. And so in this panel here, which you can see, you can recognize some patterns possibly. This is a northern sky. So for my friends in the southern hemisphere, this might not be quite as familiar to you. But at the very lower part of this, um, at your, say, 6 o'clock, there's a shape which is certainly recognizable to me. And that is, uh, it looks like a dipper. Uh, it's the constellation, as we know it, Ursa Major, and the asterism of the Big Dipper. Uh, this catalog, while there's no reference grid on this, what it is is the spacings between the stars are what in hand drawing on a scroll is what tells you the story of how we were recording the positions of stars as far back as this, which is in roughly, we think, 670 AD or so. So this is how it began, with these scrolls that were hand drawn of the map of the cosmos. And important to this is the following. All of this takes place with the unaided eye, meaning what you can see. And given the, the best eyeball that exists, uh, the faintest objects that we can see means that you only see at most roughly 5,000 stars at any given time. And that's across the entire planet. So we're all limited to a hemisphere, which has a 180 degree view. So you get like maybe 2,000, 2,500 stars, and that has to be on a clear sky with the best eye. This scroll accounted for about 1,300 stars, so that's a pretty good catalog. Let's move forward in time now, a um, 1,000 years or so, to the year 1603, and this catalog, which I love. This is Uranimotria. Um, this was a collection of 51 uh, copper plate engravings. The title of the, or the first plate, which was the title slide, is what you see on the right. Uh, we have the Uranometria at the American Museum of Natural History in the form of a rare book. 
that you can get out of our rare book collection. And when you zoom in, and I'm going to zoom into a page of this, you'll see one of the beautiful representations that we had of stars in catalogs from this era. This is Orion. And you can see the, the drawing is exquisite. This is on a copper plate. Uh, this would have been a constellation that many people saw. Um, and even in the light polluted New York City, from even Times Square, you can spot this constellation in your sky. Uh, and special to this, to Aranimatria in 1600, is that this was really the first star atlas that used a reference grid. So unlike that scroll, which had no way for you to orient, um, on this, you can see at the top and the bottom are numbers. So at this point, we had given a celestial sphere, broken it down into a coordinate system, and these stars are marked on there. Also special to this, I'm going to zoom in, and what you can see is at the armpit of Orion is a star that's drawn bigger, and it has an alpha next to it. And then at the foot of Orion, there's a star also drawn large, and um, it's also called the beta star. And so this was also the first time that we see in the literature, the use of Greek letters to denote the brightest stars. So Alpha Orionis here at the armpit, better known to most of us as Betelgeuse, and Beta Orionis at the foot, better known to many of us as Rigel, the two cornerstone stars in Orion. Um, this is now giving you some scientific information in the catalog, in these copper engravings, where you've got an attempt to showcase the bright star versus the faint star. And if you've been paying attention to the scientific, or to the, even the space social media literature, you'd know that Betelgeuse here, Alpha Orionis, just went through a very big dimming. And so you could go back to the catalog of Johannes Beyer and be able to see that in the year 1603, it was much brighter than the other stars in the constellation. So you can actually draw scientific information even from these collections of stars here. And most important, I can zoom, I can overlay on this what the stars actually look like today. So you can see how their coordinate system here was doing a really good job of actually mapping the stars. And so overlaid now, you can see it fall, falls on very nicely that the spacings between these stars are uh, quite precise. The scrolls that I showed you previously were accurate to a few degrees. And this, and that's hand drawn. And these copper engravings that we're using a reference grid are even far more accurate than that. So you can almost start to do stellar precision uh, using these catalogs to check the distances between stars. And important to this, I mean, it's a beautiful image of Orion. This next image, um, around the same time of, of Johannes Beyer's catalog, is this image by Frederick DeWitt. And it's a, um, it's a planisphere. If you've ever done nighttime observing, uh, you might remember these wheels that you take outside with you that you can spin, that you can see exactly what's up in your nighttime sky. Um, these were used for navigation purposes. Uh, and in this, it's a very artistic view. Um, and that's in part because Frederick DeWitt, who created this, uh, was both a cartographer, a map maker, and an artist. So there is certainly artistry towards depicting the stars in our sky. Uh, and in this case here, um, you get even more information with the panels in terms of the sun's position and the moon's position, but the art, of looking at stellar catalogs um, is very, very much a part of how people were able to use them. Um, this was used for navigational purposes, so it was a scientific document in many ways that the artist played a role in. So again, though, this catalog, everything I've shown you thus far, is basically limited to the unaided eye. So at best, your stellar catalogs could only come up with about 2,500 stars per hemisphere. So what happens when we introduce astronomical instrumentation? So once you get the telescope involved, photographic plates, um, cameras, CCDs, charge couple devices, well, the entirety of stellar catalogs explodes. 
so that you can start to see the depth of the Milky Way. And here is um, uh, a couple hundred years after um, Frederick DeWitt and Johannes Beyer, you get one of my sheroes, uh, Annie Jump Cannon. She's considered a Harvard computer. And this catalog, the Henry Draper catalog, the Henry Draper catalog is named after Henry Draper. Um, Annie Jump Cannon was commissioned, brought in by Edward Pickering at Harvard uh, with another army of very wonderful women that were used to classify stellar data as it was coming in. And in this, as opposed to just the couple thousand stars you could get in even the best catalogs prior in the, the years that I was just showing, we're now up to 270,000 stars by the year 1920 or so. And in this, all of a sudden you can see this image, I'm no longer showing you drawings or copper engravings, you're looking at photographs. And in, in this, you can actually see detail. You can see stars that your eye cannot make out. And so rather than having catalogs that are drawings, these are tabular. And so you start to get positions of stars and you move from there. Let's move all the way to modern day now uh, and an image of what the sky looks like. This is the two micron all sky survey. Uh, this is one of my favorites and that's part of why I'm showing you. I could show you one of the mountains of stellar catalogs that now exists. From this image, which is an image of the sky, an all sky image, you can see the plane of our Milky Way running through the center here. At the bottom, uh, those blurry two objects that you're seeing are the large and small Magellanic clouds, which are actually galaxies that are beyond the Milky Way. But the majority of what you're looking at are stars within our own galaxy. And this survey, which ran in the Northern and Southern Hemisphere on two telescopes in infrared uh, detectors, was able to take roughly half a billion stars or so. So to give you some numbers to how we've now generated massive numbers of catalog, massive numbers of stellar positions, I'll go through, oh, and as I zoom in here, what you can see is the closer in that you go, you get more detail. And so there's stars upon stars upon stars. And you have to keep track of all of them. And uh, thus is born the modern stellar catalog, various databases that we have in astronomy that astronomers can really go to, which drives all astronomical research. We, uh, astronomy is driven by diving through these massive catalogs and teasing out the scientific stories. So from this, you'll see um, a couple notable catalogs now with the major numbers that we have. U.S. Naval Observatory, which has been one of the stellar catalog keepers over time, has over a billion stars in a catalog. There's the Guide Star Catalog that the Hubble Space Telescope used, which has almost a billion stars in it. Two Micron All Sky Catalog that I just mentioned in the infrared has half a billion point sources in it. Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, almost 2 billion. Deep Near Infrared Survey of the Southern Sky, 355 million. And all of these catalogs, they had their own purpose. They may have been using a wavelength that was specific to whatever scientific goals that they had. They had a set resolution. And all of these catalogs, thousands and thousands and thousands of which exist now, are um, need to be registered to one another uh, in order for us to interpret what's going on and, um, and tease out the scientific stories. And so astronomers spend a lot of time matching catalogs and digging through catalogs and looking for scientific information. So um, one thing that's missing here that's very, very critical though, is that all of these catalogs I've mentioned thus far, even back to that scroll and the copper plates, are projections of the sky in two dimensions. Because all you can gather, the best that your eyeball can do and the majority of instrumentation can do, is tell you what the sky looks like. But it cannot give you depth. It cannot tell you how far away they are. In order to do that, you need a dedicated survey that, um, that works at astrometry that works at pulling out the depth of the stars. And while these numbers are super impressive in terms of how much stellar data we have now, 
a very key component is missing from every one of these catalogs, and that is how far away the stars are. So let me turn your attention to the best in the business of figuring out the, the, that extra dimension in astronomy. And up until two years ago, that was a European Space Agency telescope called Hipparchos. Uh, and the Hipparchos catalog, which is generated thousands of, astrometric, uh, of uh, uh, astronomical papers, scientific, the scientific literature is ripe of all that was discovered in Hipparchos. It contained within it 118,218 precious stellar distances, opening up to us a massive, at that time, 118,000 was massive in, uh, for what it ran through the 90s into the early aughts, uh, or at least the catalog is still there and people are still digging through it looking for things. Um, this catalog has driven so much astro astronomical research with 118,000 stellar distances. It's very important and it cracks open the, uh, our view of, of the three-dimensional nature. We couldn't do that until somebody started measuring distances to stars and doing so in bulk now opens it up so we can leave that projected view of the nighttime sky and enter the three-dimensional nature of the cosmos. Um, and that's where I'm going to come in from the modern day perspective. So now that we have the catalogs, we got the catalogs down, what you need is software to kind of take you off of the ground and move you through these data sets. Uh, and for that, I'll introduce to you the software that's going to drive the virtual flights that I'll take you on for the rest of this talk. And that is called Open Space. And um, this is a open space is a NASA funded open source resource that was funded because we wanted to be able to bring the cosmos to the public. So it was a planetarium software. Uh, it's really the vision of Carter Emmert and Anders Zinnerman. Anders, many of you know, as, as one of the major reasons that we're all sitting here. Uh, and a showcase of developers have been helping produce what you're going to see in the next couple of slides. There are a team of people working on open space as a software package uh, with partners from my institution at the American Museum of Natural History, NYU, uh, Linshiping University, the University of Utah, um, the Ski Center. Uh, and this all comes together to create some software that I dive into from um, a research perspective because I want to dig into the three-dimensional nature of the cosmos. So for the rest of this talk, we will go through some virtual flights that tease out the scientific stories that come to life when you have multidimensional astronomical uh, data. So for our first flight, um, I'm going to take you on the nearby solar neighborhood. And this is important to know because we are not going to go too far away from the sun. Um, and I'm going to let Alex splice the very first video in here. So these, it would be nice if you were in a dark room. Uh, so if you can lower your lights right now, it might help with this perspective. And Alex is going to start our video. We are going to depart from New York City with a view over the American Museum of Natural History, which is on the west side of Central Park there. And you can see the park nicely uh, viewed. As we're flying out, um, this is very high res data on the planet. And so a lot of open space usage is looking at um, things that you can map on a surface, so planetary structures. But my interest is really in the stars. And so as we move away where you see the Eastern seaboard come to life, Cape Cod there up through Canada, all this great satellite uh, weather data comes in, we arrive at the stars. And so here, there's our Earth with a perspective that very few of us will, uh, well, none of us, let's just be honest, none of us are going to space, even though on Wednesday, people are going to space. Uh, here in comes some of those stick figures that mark out those constellations that you saw in the earlier panels. In the very foreground here is what's called the centaur. You can see it's kind of shaped with two legs in the front and the back. And that triangular share, um, the cross shape, which is quite famous, uh, is the Southern Cross. And we're going to move away from the solar system. And as we do, 
look for the first star to move. The first star to move is going to be your closest star because we're moving at light speed away from the sun as we get out of the glare of the sun and then into the nearby solar neighborhood. And there it was. At roughly your four o'clock, a star started to move. That was Alpha Centauri. There's entire books written about how that first measurement was made to get to the parallax of that object, to get to the distance. There's a book called Parallax by the Alan Hirschfield, is the name of the author. And then here we are moving around in three dimensions where you can see now um, those constellations are gonna, I'm gonna bring up the lines again in a second, are gonna break apart because our two dimensional projection of the sky was just that. It was a projection where the stars are at very different distances from each other. Kind of sweeping into view here is also a collection of stars that are co-moving with each other called the Hyades, which is in the constellation Taurus that you might recognize. Uh, and in just one second, you'll see as I turn on the constellations lines again, there you have it. Those 2D projections were nothing more than that. Uh, the three-dimensional nature of the of the galaxy is critical to uncovering exactly what is happening in terms of the evolution of the Milky Way. So we can sweep back in um, and have a look. This is this is this is Hipparchos though. Um, Hipparchos is a fantastic survey, 118,000 stars, but everything changed on April 25th, 2018, when stellar catalogs got an enormous, enormous pickup. And that is what I call the Gaia revolution. The European Space Agency released a catalog on April 25th, 2018, from this little telescope on the corner of my screen here, um, which is called Gaia, which is orbiting right now at about a million miles from you in a Lagrange point, a stable orbit between the Earth and the Sun. And this is that two-dimensional, two-dimension projection of a Gaia all-sky image. Similar to what I showed you from two mass, this is abundant in stars. Um, there's so many stars in this image, actually, that they're not um, showing individual point sources, but rather they're showing densities of stars. So you get the Milky Way across the center of this, uh, the large and small Magellanic clouds at the bottom, but most importantly is the number. So at 118,000 stars in Hipparchos, we could bootstrap and really make sense of those billion star catalogs, but we didn't have distances for more than the 118,000. Gaia provided us with 1.3 billion distances on April 25th, 2018. So we really entered into a new era of mapping when you're able to get that many three-dimensional points into your catalog. So instead of 118,000 to work on, 1.3 billion, that number on, on catalogs that have billions of stars, we now can really fly through the cosmos at a rate that brings out so much science. So um, I'm gonna go back in to another flight and show you how different it looks. These are stars that you cannot see with your eye. Again, you only have 5,000 or so that your eye can make out. Uh, and this is gonna take us into a new level. So let's take a new flight through the nearby solar neighborhood and see what things look like. So I'll have Alex, um, and just again, <clears throat> another view. Here we are, we're leaving the earth and uh, those same constellation lines are up so that you get some idea of the structure that the ancients were looking at. And we're gonna move away. This is still Hipparchos that's on here, the 118,000 stars that were the gold standard. And as we're moving away uh, in a few seconds, there, comes an overwhelming number of stars to play with. So moving away from the solar system, these stars, by the way, are color coded by temperature, by actually how luminous they are. So we don't have temperature measurements for many of them. We're moving out from the glare of the sun. So we're out at about, uh, once we start moving in this, we're, we're about like 100 to 200 light years away from the sun. You can see overwhelming density of stars. And this is just impressive in the sheer quantity that we have. This is uh, a, a small fraction of that 1.3 billion that we're moving around in. Uh, and as you're moving through the data, 
what my scientific eye starts to look for, which is a natural thing that a human looking at a pattern would look for, is over densities. I'm looking for clumps. I'm looking for structures that I wasn't able to see before. I'm looking for stars that are clearly close to each other uh, and that are possibly co-moving and co-evolving teasing out the intrinsic structure of the Milky Way that you could not previously see. And uh, so at this point, you're only looking at a few million of those uh, 1.3 billion stars. So let's come back in. And what are the scientific stories that we can tell from here? Uh, this is where we can start to dig in to the questions, the scientific questions. One more flight I wanna take you on. Uh, and this is going to be a flight through the Milky Way galaxy uh, in the sense that all of the other videos that I was showing you used an image of the Milky Way. And so let's go to this video that's going to show you how we can now map the Milky Way, the actual bulk density of the Milky Way. So here we're beginning again with a flight that image that you're seeing of what you might have seen when you go out to a clear nighttime sky of the stream of stars that we call the Milky Way, that was actually an image that we placed. And now I've overlaid on top of that specific stars in Gaia. These are actually hot stars, hot and young stars that map out our galaxy because they stay in their natal environment, which is for the most part, the plane of the galaxy is also where a lot of the star formation is happening. Uh, and we can leave the sun and that structure, the absence of stars where you have um, black areas in the Milky Way is actually mapped here. It's not in the image. And so as we're moving away, let's move away. All of those are going to come to life and show you the structure. So this is roughly a million stars in this visualization. Only the stars selected that map the plane of the Milky Way, the hot stars. I didn't even choose the other kinds of stars that might map out the Milky Way. As we're kind of moving around it here, you can see some needle effects as you get further away. There is clustering that happens in the Milky Way, young stellar clusters, where the distances become uncertain as you get further away. And so in that, you'll see these needle effects. It's an artifact of the data, but it's an important one to see visualized. So let's switch back into the presentation and we can go even further into the um, uh, into our data sets. So that's just positions. All I did was start you on the epic amount of data that exists and the flights you can take through it, but all of it is complemented by far more information. As I said earlier, you have all of these, these catalogs that had their own purpose and need to be rendered or matched to each other so that we can dig through the scientific stories, which is how astronomers spend so much of their time. For instance, you'd really like to look at the full velocities of the stars. I only showed you a flight as if we were moving through space in a picture, in a, in a, in a moment. I wasn't showing you how things are changing over time, but we can do that if you give the full velocities. So Gaia, for instance, gives us at this point 8 million stars with radial velocities, so a velocity in the direction towards or away from us, which when combined with the, um, the tangential velocities that you can extract when you solve for their distances, give you the full velocity of any given source as it's moving through the galaxy. You can also get variability of stars. So anytime you go outside and look up at the nighttime sky, you're getting a singular image. You're getting what the stars look like when you kind of walk outside and you just open your eyes and see, right? But if you watch for long enough, you'll see that they're changing. They vary. Sometimes that brightness will come and go. Uh, you can get a variable star. This is how we find exoplanets. And so we've got the Transiting Exoplanet Satellite Survey or Survey Satellite called TESS, which is currently mapping 500,000 stars for planets, but will have an all sky variability survey very soon. And then there's the Rubin Observatory. The Rubin Observatory, or the, it's just recently been named for Vera Rubin, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, a big telescope that's gonna be, that's being built in Chile right now on Cerro Pachon, that's going to image the sky every three nights as seen from Chile. So every three nights, we're gonna get the whole sky, what it looks like, and then we're gonna return and we're gonna do it again. 
And so you'll be able to see the transient nature of the of the universe, of, of the galaxy, really. You'll be able to see stars changing their brightness all over the place. We have no idea how that looks. You'd love to be able to visual, visualize that in its space, in where these objects are. Uh, there's also compositional information that you want to extract out. Uh, and there's multiple surveys that are online now and coming online in the coming years that are going to be providing chemical abundances of stars throughout the galaxy that will tell you the history of the stars, the, the, the impact factors possibly of what's happened to a given star. Um, we, we look at stars, we see what they look like right now, their chemical uh, abundances. And say, for instance, the sun, we know how much uh, sodium and potassium and calcium it has. And we think we understand the age of the sun and you can compare that in these abundances across millions, if not billions of stars and be able to tease out events that have occurred. And you should do that, I would argue, inside of these three-dimensional representations of the galaxy or at least complement your astronomical research with this because you can really visualize how and where events might have happened. So let's move into another flight, this one taking advantage of stellar velocities. And so this is going to be a flight through time that's gonna show stellar motion. So one of my favorite videos um, for many reasons, and uh, Alex is gonna put it in here. The sun is blown up at the center. The stars are a little dim. I brighten them up so it gives you a good sense of Gaia stars. And now we've turned time on. What I mean when I turn time on is that uh, open space software allows you to take intervals of time at one second intervals. It's moving the stars forward in their full velocities, how they're moving through the galaxy at a rate of every 10 million, every second is about 10 million years. This is something your eye will never see because we don't live long enough, right? Uh, however, this is the kind of thing that we constantly do in astronomy. We project the velocities forward in order to check things. You check to see, for instance, and this is so cool, you check to see how often stars fly by each other. So how often do you get a star that kind of flies close enough to the sun that it can disturb our Oort cloud, which is where you have all of our long period comets? Uh, that's really important to know because an object as it flies by can disrupt the nature of your environment, sending in debris that might come into the inner solar system and cause trouble. There's also, you can just see clumps of stars that were co-moving with each other in here. All of this gets teased out scientifically. And in this kind of uh, virtual environment, we can actually see it happening. And you can play with the time increments as much as you want within the software to reason. Um, okay, let's come back into the presentation uh, and I'll switch over now to another viewpoint, which is particularly fascinating. As I mentioned, the you might want to look at chemical abundances of stars. And so we can switch now to taking a flight through space, through the three dimensions that are provided with a Gaia catalog, the, the Gaia catalog that we have. And let's highlight stellar chemistry. There are many missions that are ongoing that are looking at all sky, checking on what exactly is inside of stars. So let's switch and Alex has inserted it here and let's start the video here where we're going to fly out. And now the only stars that are shown are stars that have uh, chemistry measured. So it looks a little bit funny as you see these circular bits. Those circular bits are the plates the observational plates, it's again a projection effect, that had hundreds of fibers in them, so they were able to take spectroscopic information of them. And as we fly out, they're color-coded now, all of the stars, by the amount of iron that they have. Uh, and so, oh, and coming into view here is a very famous footprint projected on the sky. That's the Kepler Space Telescope's footprint. Which was, which was struck really hard by, um, or gone after really hard by observational astronomers, looking at the abundances of all those stars, as you want to know what is the chemistry of the stars that are hosting exoplanets. And that was an exoplanet mission. So now we can kind of fly through, and as I move out in this video, 
you're seeing the stars that are green are more iron rich and the stars that are purple or um, blue to purple are stars that are particularly iron poor. And that's just one uh, element. Iron is particularly important in part because the amount of metal that's available, and astronomers call anything that's like heavier than helium a metal, um, that any of that that's available comes in the multi-epic of star formation. So the more stars that have formed, the more material that you have and the heavier elements that are available for you. So it also tells you a bit of the history of what's happened. But we're moving through the stars now and you can look for structure. You can look to see where the stars are that might be similar in composition. Um, it's, it's a great visual check, but it's also a fantastic way of looking for, um, for any correlation that you might want. Okay, so once we're, uh, once we're out of the video where we've got all of this chemistry mapped here, we're gonna move into scientific discoveries that are enabled as well from this visualization software. So scientific discovery uh, within it, I've been basically showcasing for you with a little bit of a highlight of the scientific discovery, how we do things, but this is a plot from a paper that I worked on Myself and Jonathan Gagne, um, he's currently working at a planetarium in Montreal. Uh, we've, been, we've been searching far and near for all of the young stars near the sun. Uh, and the way that we've been doing it is through clustering algorithms and a some Bayesian inference where you look at their full velocities, U, V, W velocities are telling you the velocity of a given object in, out, and around the galaxy and the positional information. So you need that that distance measurement and you need that full velocity. And that plot at the center here is how we visually check and we visually check everything in order to really see whether or not we found a new cluster. Instead, I'll turn to the video, which will take you on a flight through the youngest stars. And so let's move in to um, within about 15, we're gonna move out to about 1500 light years or so. And this, this is, definitely my favorite visualization that um, I can create. So it, it's a little flight along the Milky Way here. And as we're seeing it, the constellation lines are on so that you can see some of that familiar structure that I was mentioning from the early times of what people saw in their structures. Alpha, uh, the centaur and the Southern Cross is there. You'll see these red constellations that come up. Those are the zodiacal constellations and the scorpion is prominent there as the scorpion is the host to a very important star forming region. So now overlaid on top of that map of the Milky Way, I've put on stars that are um, all considered young. So these are stars that we have measurements, very specific measurements made so that you can see that they're young objects. And we're gonna fly away from the sun for the very first time for many people seeing this, uh, you're gonna see what those structures look like that comes to life. So where are the stars exactly? The two-dimensional projection only gives you so much. The three-dimensional projection tells you a tremendous amount about what has happened to these young associations. Uh, so we can fly out even more and you'll see that this is a sphere. And that sphere is because we're kind of capping it at roughly 1500 light years or 500 parsecs. Um, and we're doing that in part because that's where the distances are really, really good in Gaia, so that you're sure that you've got a very robust measurement. We kind of move around these structures. Every dot on here is a young star, and that cluster is just, that clustering is just fantastic. That is the structure of the star formation factories near the sun. Um, as we kind of move around, what was highlighted in the colors that came on is the Vela Association directly um, to the left of it that looks kind of like an elongated mass. That's Orion, Orion, uh, which I started the talk on. And the reason why I've overlaid these color images on top of Vela is because a second paper came out recently or a paper came out recently that was showcasing the components of that that might be co-moving, so sub-associations. And now we utilize that velocity and time and we're moving forward on these objects so that we can actually see if they're moving together or not. 
I use this kind of visualization in order to tease out when I find objects that they just don't look right. I mean, all of the, the algorithms that I use that I'm sitting there at my computer and I'm trying to find them, there's nothing like being able to see the stars moving so that I can actually infer whether I've got some contamination in here. Uh, all right, back on to the presentation. Let's move into another scientific discovery element. And that is um, within this data set, once you have motion and distances, you can get into the uh, co-moving stars, stars that are clustered with each other. Those were young stars before, but let's take a flight through stars that are co-moving. Um, that previous image was a paper by a grad student at Princeton, Semyong Oh, that I got fascinated with. She located through a friends of friends method, a number of stars that were co-moving with each other. Uh, and I took those 10,000 stars, I put them in our visualization um, software, and I tried to figure out if any of them were new and how many of them were truly co-moving with each other. And this is the result. Every one of the dots here is co-moving with at least one, but up to 150 other objects. And so you're seeing um, true clumping. And I was able to move forward very quickly in digging through her catalog because I was able to project it here and really get an idea of the, um, of the nature of all of the stars as they were moving. So this, this is giving you an idea of how one would take a scientific data set and while there's the discovery space of just flying through and searching for things, there's also this method where somebody else has made a discovery and you just want to kind of figure out what they've found. Uh, and that's what this visualization is, is giving you. So Alex, we can jump back into the presentation since we're getting shorter on time and we're almost wrapped up in the visuals here. Uh, and I wanna give you a slight highlight of how we do this in open space, since this is a visualization conference uh, and you might be interested in the software itself. And this is a screenshot of what we play with within the software itself. So, um, the software, what you saw was the rendered version, but what we're usually playing with is this drop down of this menus um, and properties. So you have preloaded catalogs. You can load whatever catalog that you want in here that's positional. Uh, you have the ability to control time. As I mentioned, this is very critical when you want to play with velocities. And then there's catalog properties that you can play with. Uh, and that allows you to play with luminosity and change various aspects. And then you have your viewpoint. And so you're flying through your data in a truly scientific moment that makes you feel like you're on a space voyage through scientific data, which is supremely fascinating. But there are limitations to the visualizations. And this is very important for me to point out. All of the distances and velocities that I've shown have errors associated with them. And those aren't shown. What we really should be flying through is not the pretty images, which are fantastic for education purposes and, and the general public, but we should really be flying through error columns, both in the positions of these stars, as well as when we're moving time forward. There's also extra forces that I'd really like to be able to include uh, that would help you understand exactly how the motions are working. Um, and the color balance isn't quite right for some of them. So when I was showing the chemistry, I've chosen what that color balance should look like. So open space was developed as a planetarium product, not a scientific product. There are other astronomical software packages that are intended for scientific data exploration. Uh, software packages such as Glue that Alyssa Goodman at Harvard and Tom Robita have been developing. It's a multi-dimensional data exploration tool that uses your standard um, astronomical plotting mechanisms. And then Aladdin, which is a fantastic piece of software. I use both of these daily in my research um, to, to, to really peruse through and dig into catalogs. So one of the things that we've been trying is to keep each software package in its lane and combine them. And so Glue can work with open space. Aladdin can work with this open space software to create a powerful tool that allows you to do what you do best. Let the visualization software do the best things that it can do and allow the um, analysis tools to do that deeper dive that you might want to do. Uh, and in so doing, um, we've tried this with Glue, this multi-dimensional uh, data exploration tool 
in that planetarium software in order to create a, on the left-hand side here is an image of the, of how Glue works, where you have various data sets. This is a data set of exoplanets, uh, exoplanets that are, have various parameters that you might want to explore, mass, temperature of a host star, inclination angle of the system, radius of the star, radius of the planet. You can do your slicing and dicing and threshing within this software package and just project it into open space and then do your virtual flights that way. I think this is really kind of cutting edge aspects of taking um, data exploration tools and combining them with visualization tools. So the last question and the last minute here, I'll say, um, what is the best equipment or location for immersing in these new virtual tours and this, this kind of investigation in astronomy? And this is a question I get asked all the time. Do you just use your laptop or a big screen? And so, yes, and we've just kind of showed it as best we could with the resolution that we can get in YouTube or, um, uh, you know, how we've done this in this way. But there is nothing like being in your natal environment. How does astronomical research work? Well, you're looking up at the sky. You would be within the cosmos, right? Like you want to be immersed in your data. And so one of the best places to do that is a planetarium where you're in a domed structure where you can navigate yourself back to the olden times, how they did it, but then really dig in almost on a starship. This is an image of myself giving a presentation to a, a, an audience, a sold out audience of over 400 people that wanted to fly through the data. And it's almost like I'm just doing scientific research in front of them as we fly through, this was the chemical data. Uh, and, and, and not just the general public can do this exploration. It's extremely collaborative to be in this kind of environment. Uh, this is an image of us, a uh, huge amount of work went into what this picture encapsulates, where for the very first time to these 90 or so people that you're seeing, all are astronomers, we were flying through the Gaia data for the very first time. And these are all uh, researchers or folks that had worked on the data analysis themselves and were getting to see it in a flight for the first time. So these immersive places are really special for looking at the data. And the last thing I'll note is that I recently uh, worked on a white paper um, in the United States, we have this every 10 years, the decadal survey where we throw out our white papers for our most important ideas that we think we should get out there. Uh, and we threw this idea out called ideas, <laughs> immersive dome experiences for accelerating science. And it's the culmination of everything that I've been mentioning to you. Modern day astrophysics really demands, it's three dimensional and it kind of demands the best visualization tools we can come up with. And the dome really brings it to life. So yes, you can do this on a laptop or a big screen. A dome is really perfect for this because you're in that natural environment of the nighttime sky. And I think the conference of the future, once anybody starts going to conferences again, is going to be in a planetarium. So my conclusions, um, stellar catalogs have really advanced. We went from hand drawings of a couple a thousand stars or so to um, modern day tabular catalogs of billions of stars. Uh, and the multi-dimensional nature of these catalogs is highly complemented by visualization tools. And so merging some already existing tools um, will really optimize functionality and advance astronomical research. Okay, that is the end of my talk. And so if you have questions, I think you can put them in Discord or the YouTube chat. Ivan, you can tell me which we've got, if we have any questions. Jackie, first and foremost, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. I see a stream of uh, upload in the YouTube channel. Uh, I have collected some questions from uh, the audience, so I might uh, take those questions first. Maybe you can see them as well yourself. One question is coming from Mr. Derek Bradley, and he is asking about whether the software, which is playing forward millions of years to take into account gravitational forces between stars, 
and collisions and so on, or is it just taking an infinitesimal delta and assuming that the velocity doesn't change? Yeah, that's a great question. It's one of the things that I was highlighting on one of my slides that I really like to build into the software. It does not take into account the gravitational potential. So the motion that you're seeing is the linear motion that you would get out of just taking time and assuming the star is on the trajectory it's on and will stay on that trajectory. That really only is valid for a couple million years because at that point you have to take into account the visualization uh, or sorry, the galactic potential. Okay, another question was, uh, uh, which planetariums have these presentations uh, like the fly-throughs you showed and the idea? Yeah, so um, there are several planetariums that can do this kind of work. Um, and I have given this talk, well, sorry, not this talk, but I have taken the Gaia data set on the road to various planetariums. The Morrison Planetarium, for instance, in San Francisco has done this with me there to give this kind of presentation. Um, Hayden Planetarium, Adler Planetarium hasn't tried it yet that I know of, but they could. Um, the ones, I don't know anybody in Europe that's done it yet. The Gaia European Space Agency is of course European and there is a beautiful piece of software that I should highlight called um, Gaia Sky that um, some astronomers have been working on, one of which is Stefan Jordan. And uh, he's been trying to work with a planetarium in, in Germany in order to get their flights going. But I don't think that that's gone through yet. Um, but it's very limited in part because we've tried this with open space, but um, but it's, it's limited in that you need people like me or somebody that really knows the data to take you on these tours. So this is cutting edge. I'm gonna call it cutting and bleeding edge kinds of ways of looking through the data. Thank you very much. Um, I, was, uh, I would like to uh, impregnate my question, which was when I was looking at the visualizations, um, I mean, it is beautiful to have the space journey, but I still with my, uh, you know, uh, untrained eye was basically seeing a lot of dots which were nicely shining and it was, I was, I could say totally lost. I can imagine that the astronomers are of course much better navigated, but I'm wondering whether, whether this, you hit the wall in some case with the density and you are lost as well. And if so, what kind of navigational aids are you using then in the space so that you get back in, in the, in the, in the three-dimensional orientation? Yeah, it's a, it's a great uh, question. And um, so the, if you just throw 1.3 billion stars up, they were, they're only going to look like little tiny dots to you. There's like no way that anybody is going to naturally look at that kind of overwhelming amount of information and tease out. And I shouldn't say it's impossible, but it's very close to impossible. And I spend a lot of time looking at it. Instead, you vet the data. And so you curate the parts of the data that you want to look through so that your purpose is really narrowed down in what you're looking for. For instance, I showed that co-moving stars um, video, which was all dots, but every one of those dots has to be moving with another dot. So when you look at it, you know that that's what you're looking for. Is it actually moving with another object or is it not? And so we vet our storylines so that we can navigate. I also, I will say that once you dig in, um, you start to see landmarks within the data. Every time I take a flight, every time I get into the data, I, um, I rediscover the Pleiades and the Hyades. The Pleiades and the Hyades are two star clusters that are very close to the sun. So if I ever got lost in space, um, I would have my beacons that I would know I need to go to in order to get back home. Mm -hmm. And this also, I think, is a great lesson for people that want to learn how to navigate the stars 
what would you use? How do you find yourself in a position where you could figure out where you are in this three-dimensional universe? There's lots of lessons that we can teach that have so much science included in them, including like looking at the temperatures. You know that you don't have an O or a B star, a really hot star near the sun. So if you find yourself amongst a bunch of them, looking around, you're in a very distant area from your solar neighborhood and you're sitting in a young star area. So there's ways that I could take you on a bit of a tour that, um, uh, and each one would be catered for a different purpose that would help you understand where you are and where you're going. Mm -hmm. I see uh, one more question from the, from the poll. Uh, how about virtual reality devices? Would they be in, in any way useful or you think uh, you uh, astrophysicists will stay in the dome for longer? Yeah, so there's uh, trade-offs to virtual uh, reality devices. And in my own experience, I have not had a VR experience that I think was um, at the highest, that could tease out the science at the highest end like it does when I'm in a dome. And that's uh, in part because it's not collaborative, in the especially in the same way. Um, I find it difficult to collaborate within the device because you're kind of you're isolated. You've got one thing on your face. Um, and the dome experience allows you to have conversations with people far more like you're taking a flight. Um, that said, there has been some really awesome work that's been done out of a planetarium in Cape Town in South Africa that's been working with a radio telescope that comes with these cubes of data uh, the radio, astron radio astronomy has big, big data cubes that they have to look through in order to extract out whatever scientific purpose they're looking for. Uh, and this, this planetarium in Cape Town has been taking the data cubes that come from this radio telescope and putting the general public inside so they can see it, but also scientists so they can look through their data. That is definitely far more immersive where you're inside of the data. So the limitation of a dome is that you, you still are, you know, two dimensional to a certain extent. You're flying through the data, but you're on a, on a screen versus in a VR environment where you're, you're around it. So that's the advantage I would give it. And it has certainly been used to great effect for this planetarium in Cape Town. But for Gaia, I have found um, what I really want to do is have collaborative conversations with other scientists that I'm working on a data set with within this flight environment where we can be moving through the data, pointing at something, picking something out, turning the time on and seeing actually if we're seeing a structure and emotion that we believe. And then going back to our data um, analysis tools, making a cut and coming back to it. I don't get that same effect when I'm in a virtual reality environment. Jackie, thank you very much. Due to uh, the limitation of time, we will have to stop at this point. There are more questions in the Discord and also in the YouTube channel. So I would like to encourage you guys to continue the conversation. But this session is over and I would like to ask the audience to give one more big applause to Jackie. Thank you, my first virtual talk.